Uh, yeah, right there. Uh, up until now, you hadn't directed a film since 1995, right. Home for the Holidays. Was it hard to jump back in the director's chair? Like, was there any challenges that you had after having such a long hiatus from yeah. directing? Yeah, it was a long time between Home for the Holidays and this film. I, uh, I, I worked on a film called Flora Plum that uh, got uh, canceled two weeks before shooting. Uh, and then I subsequently set it up again, and I went through prep twice, two more times on that film, and both times uh, it fell apart. Well, the other time, that's three times that movie fell apart. So I feel like I directed that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can just add that one to my list. Um, yeah, yeah. The, I'll tell you what's changed a lot is, is, is technology has changed. And in 15 years, it's amazing what you can do now that I couldn't do then. Uh, especially, you know, thinking back to Little Man Tate, um, and, you know, killing myself over trying to figure out how to have these numbers arrive at his face and having to shoot a different kind of camera and a different kind of film and he wasn't able to move his head and the camera couldn't push in and, and there was all this stuff that we had to go through um, that, you know, now we do those things every five minutes and you just do them on the app. Uh, so uh, the technology is really what changed the most, and I'm a little bit of an old fogey about the technology, and it was nice having Mel around, because Mel's a, a fantastic director, uh, epic director, but he also really loves all the new technology stuff. He's completely up on it, and uh, really believes that that's the future, and, um, and I could ask him when I was confused about something, about, you know, trying to figure out how to seam in something that was going to end up being the effects department issue, he, he, I could just go, Come here, come here, come here, tell me, I gotta work. No. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there's someone right there. Yes. Uh, first of all, as someone who has dealt with depression, I want to thank you for bringing a very honest movie um, about the effects on the people who have it and the families that right. deal with it. Um, but my question is, uh, the voice for the beaver, mm -hmm. uh, was it written that way or who came up with the voice? Uh, the accent? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I, I'm first of all, yeah. I, uh, it is a film that deals with two kinds of depression. You know, the uh, chemical depression, uh, the type of depression that can't be cured with talk therapy or with uh, a pill uh, or any kind of quick fix yoga solution. Um, you know, Walter Black needs help, and um, uh, it's a very dire situation, very different than the kind of de depression that many of us encounter every single day. Uh, uh, but, but the film has talks about that as well, which is you know, sadness and tragedy are part of our lives as much as the comedy of our life is. And as you get older, it gets heavier and heavier. And you know, what do you do with all that stuff? What do you do with uh, missing people that are dead and all the little things that don't make any sense and that are unfair and global warming and you know, uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, the the sadness of modern life. And um, I think the film has an answer for that. You know. I think articulately talked about in the last act, um, and it, it, you know, if it makes anybody feel better without romanticizing depression in any way, I feel that the artistic creative impulse is very hard to uh, uh, figure out where where depression starts and the creative impulse ends, uh, because you know, we what I do for a living is to obsessively ruminate on difficult things over and over and over again so that I can get through them and come up with solutions, real emotional solutions for them. So I, I believe that sadness is a huge part of my life and um, I've made a lot of money on sadness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, voice of the beaver. Uh, yeah, it was written like that. It was crazy. It was, uh, I think, uh, it was very important that Walter, we really understand that Walter was trying to disassociate himself from himself, and that he had to create this alter ego or this character who was nothing like him. So he wanted to create somebody who was blue collar, because he wasn't, uh, who had, who was blunt and had answers for everything, which he didn't, who was in some ways detached and not particularly emotional. Um, somebody who was vital. And, and uh, was really loved life and um, could, could inspire people in that way. All the things that Walter's not. And so we decided he should sound like, you know, Michael Caine, only faster. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, yeah, at the end, on the other end. Yeah. Okay, so I was particularly impressed by how effective you were able to juxtapose how us as a mass, we, we kind of 
We adopt and we perpetuate these imaginary relationships. Mm -hmm. When we get to the more intimate level, it becomes almost perverse. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to kind of talk a little bit more about the parasocial relationship that you were kind of creating between mm -hmm. you know, Beaver and Mr. Yusuf. Okay, I don't know what parasocial is, but I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Survival tools serve a purpose. Uh, they help you survive things that you would not survive attack any other way. And you know, you can have a dramatic circumstance when you're young and you adapt by using a survival tool. And the problem is, is that as you get older, uh, the survival tool, um, that coping mechanism, uh, keeps you from experiencing life in a full way. And the survival skill is killing you. And you gotta get rid of the survival skill. Um, and that's when you can evolve beyond the need for it. Um, so, I mean, as a parable, as a fable, uh, the beaver is, um, uh, you know, the answer, uh, the survival skill answer to a man who feels in a moment of spiritual crisis that he has two choices, a life sentence or a death sentence. And the beaver is the one thing that will allow him to not have to choose either of those paths. I don't know if I'm <laughs> <laughs> it would help if you knew what Paris yeah. I don't believe that you know what that means. I apologize. I'm just trying to make sure we split them up here. Okay, Dev Center in the middle there. Hey. Somebody. Tony, I'm so excited you're here. It's my 21st birthday. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering what the most challenging and what the most rewarding aspects were for you to both direct and star in movies. Uh, yeah, uh, acting and directing, uh, the, I did it on Lil Man Tate and I said I would never do it again. <laughs> and it's funny because I've been having this conversation with Mel for many years. He directed himself in Man Without a Face, his first film, and he said, I'm never doing that again. And then of course he went and did Braveheart and killed himself. <laughs> you know, he had extensions and makeup and prosthetics and all that. He was on every single day of the shoot. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we created these impossible tasks for ourselves. It's a very bad idea to act and direct at the same time, and nobody should ever do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you do get something. You get, you get. I think, I think I'm happy with my performance, and I'm happy with what I was able, uh, what I was able to do for Mel's character. And I was concerned when I brought Mel on. I thought, who, who am I going to get? And uh, who am I going to get that's going to be able to ground the film in the drama, and that's not going to be tempted by his lightness? and to continually bring him back to the dramatic circumstance. Also, to be the eyes and ears of the audience. I mean, her perspective is the audience's perspective. Meredith's, Meredith uh, changes in terms of her relationship to the beaver, how she feels about him, how she thinks about him, her suspiciousness, her, you know, how she sudden, suddenly starts realizing that he's destroying her family, exactly the same time that the audience does. She brings her through uh, the film in a way that the beaver can't because he's crazy. Uh, so I thought, well, who am I going to get? You know, that's age appropriate, and that you're going to believe uh, they know each other and love each other. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him, and I went to his house, and I said, well, I'm going to ask you. So I haven't told anybody else. Are you okay with it? And he started laughing, and he was like, oh, of course, it'll be fine. And I knew that what he required as an actor. Uh, he's, he's so easy to work with. I've made a film with him before, and he's so easy to direct, and he doesn't have neuroses uh, that a lot of other actors do, so I knew that I could get away with it. Uh, uh, I, I mean, the biggest challenge on this film, just as a, a, big, a big challenge, was getting the tone right. It has a very weird tone, and you have to embrace that tone, but also uh, massage it a little bit so that the audience uh, you know, starts out with a light film and starts out in some ways in a similar, because, because the beaver is the narrator, you know, through the, the beaver's voice. Uh, it's a very detached voice, and we see him in a very detached way, in a light way in the beginning, and then as time goes on, as he darkens, so does the film. Uh, also, keeping the two stories, you know, the son's story and the father's story, keeping each of them as interesting as the other, because you have to pop back and forth. That's a huge challenge, and I've had that problem in other movies. And I tried to, I tried to really spend a lot of time on the script initially, before we started shooting, really figuring that out. You know, how do I make Anton's story as compelling as Mel's story? And how do I have them refer to each other visually and in other ways so that you're seamlessly kind of bouncing back in between those two worlds? Um.